Now, it's, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Grant Innes, a guy who probably doesn't need an introduction, but having said that, he has by far the funniest autobiography, and you'll see why. So Dr. Innes is an emergency physician from Calgary, and in addition to medical research, his main interests include athletics and literature. He was drafted second by the Buffalo Sabres in the 1982 NHL draft, but was sidelined by an ankle injury before the season began. After this disappointment, he turned his attention to tennis, narrowly, narrowly losing the 1986 Wimbledon semifinal to John McEnroe. Remember it well. Many of you will remember his, the, the dramatic game-winning touchdown catch he made for the Dallas Cowboys in the 1986 Super Bowl. In addition to practicing emergency medicine, he writes scientific articles for the prestigious journal Nature and participates in pro-pipeline demonstrations <clears throat> excuse me, across Canada. That's so good. You can stop there and you do <clears throat> Okay, well, I, I have to thank uh, the guys at St. Paul's for inviting me back again. And clearly it illustrates a problem with their evidence-based speaker selection methods. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so this, let's see where my little clicker is. There it is. This is the title that I started with. It's the same title as every year, but it's hard to come up with new titles. I did actually take some feedback from um, the audience evaluations last year. And a few people last year said that, uh, you know, this talk is too much about tables and data and statistical mumbo jumbo, and I need to simplify it. So I thought about that, and I took it to mean that the other 330 people there were probably craving more methodology. <laughs> so um, I changed the focus, I changed the title a little bit, and the things I'm gonna teach you are gonna be incredibly helpful in having you uh, impress your colleagues, baffle consultants, and amaze your patients. Okay, anyway, conflicts of interest. Uh, I'm an emergency physician. Nobody's going to give me money. And I would like to summarize 10 recent articles and hope to give you at least five things that will change your practice immediately. And it's case-based, so we'll start with a case. This is a three-year-old who comes in after having a febrile seizure. An hour later, he's alert, looks well. So which is the following is true regarding post-discharge care. A, Tylenol is ineffective in preventing recurrent febrile seizures. B, rectal Tylenol is more effective than oral Tylenol. C, Tylenol is non-toxic and may reduce recurrent seizures. D, consider Tylenol for high-risk patients, keeping in mind the risks of hypothermia and anaphylaxis. So, we'll answer that one later. This is a a uh, single center randomized trial uh, from Japan where apparently rectal Tylenol is a thing. And these, um, these uh, authors suggested that if you look at the literature that uh, there's a, um, maybe not a lot of evidence, but there's some evidence out there that maybe Tylenol doesn't prevent febrile seizures after you've got a kid with a febrile seizure. So anyway, they decided they would do a randomized trial of Tylenol, um, well, I'd say versus placebo, but there was no placebo. It was a single blinded study, kids from six months to five years with a febrile seizure. They got 10 milligrams per kilogram of Tylenol every six hours after having their seizure for a 24 hour period. If they were in the inter intervention group, the control group was sent home with nothing. So their outcome was, did the child have a recurrent seizure during the same fever episode? So good journal, pediatrics. Now, I, a few minutes ago, I made fun of some people who said that, you know, this should be less about numbers and tables, you know, and that's, that was um, unfortunate, and it's something I'm just going to have to live with for the rest of my life. 
But I did take their advice and I simplified by eliminating the numbers from the data tables. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what you can see here is that the Tylenol was substantially better um, <laughs> with about one third of the um, recurrent seizure rates. Um, they, uh, they also acknowledged that the compliance with Tylenol was not great, so they did another analysis, uh, a multivariable analysis, where they looked at all the factors that might predict a seizure and included, did the patient take Tylenol in those regression models? And uh, so both in the crude grouping that I show you in the table there uh, and in the, a multivariable regression, uh, the administration of Tylenol is the biggest factor in the occurrence of um, downstream seizures. So the authors conclude that a Tylenol is safe, it may prevent seizure recurrence, and they did specifically point out, if you read the fine print in the article, that there were no cases of hypothermia, hypotension, or anaphylaxis with Tylenol, so even that has to really ease your mind, I think, if you're you know, considering pulling the trigger on Tylenol for a febrile child. <clears throat> okay, so there's, there's, some, there's some problems with this study. It's an unblinded outcome. Parents had to identify seizures. Um, when I look through the study, and if anyone's familiar with this study, I would welcome uh, for you to correct me, but I looked through this in detail and tried to figure out how did they identify recurrent seizures if they happened. And all it says is they told the parents to return to the ED if they had a recurrent seizure. So they didn't contact everybody. So, you know, if, a, if somebody was appropriately, appropriately reassured after their initial seizure, they may or may not return. And I think that could be a real weakness of this study. Uh, it seems like it's a low dose of Tylenol, 10 milligrams per kilogram. Of course, you know, children are small adults. I guess you use small doses of Tylenol. Um, and I mentioned that they determined Tylenol safety in an odd sort of way. Okay, so I think the answer to that, Tylenol is non-toxic and may reduce recurrent seizures. Next case, a 31-year-old male with recurrent drug-induced psychosis arrives with police. He's being held face down, screaming on a stretcher. The most appropriate treatment is... Haldol, midazolam, olanzapine, uh, larger doses of Haldol, or something else. So this is a really interesting study. The title is midazolam, uh, olanzapine, zip ziprazidone, or Haldol for acute agitation. I eliminated ziprazidone. It's expensive, it's teratogenic, it's difficult to work with. I don't even know if it's available in Canada. Uh, so this was a prospective observational study. These authors noted that they tried to do a randomized clinical trial, but their ethics committee turned them down because they were not um, looking for informed consent from the patients. Um, so anyway, what they did is they, uh, impl they implemented uh, over a 15-week period, they did three weeks of low-dose Haldol, three weeks of olanzapine, three weeks of midazolam, three weeks of high-dose uh, Haldol, and just made it a clinical uh, protocol and then looked at the outcomes uh, in these different groups. And their, their outcome was the proportion of patients who were adequately sedated at 15 minutes based on a motor scale that goes from uh, plus four, which is really agitated, uh, to minus four, which is really not agitated, uh, and zero, which is adequate sedation. And uh, primary outcome was at 15 minutes. So this is really impressive because over a 15-week period, they enrolled about 800 patients. Uh, so 88% uh, alcohol-related. I mean, you know, eight, 800 takedowns, that's 50 a week. It makes you want to go work in Minnesota. Um, so the best drug, they said, was midazolam at 15 minutes. Olanzapine uh, was also faster than Haldol. Uh, the adver adverse effects were rare. Um, and they concluded midazolam is probably the most effective agent. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but this shows the time to adequate sedation, adequate sedation being you fall below the red line. So you see, eh, there's probably not a huge difference between those drugs, 
Olanzapine and midazolam go down quicker than Haldol does. Uh, you'll notice that with Olanzapine uh, and Haldol, when you go down, you stay down. Um, with midazolam, not so much, and about 45% of midazolam patients needed to be resedated uh, within an hour or so. So that was uh, one consideration with the midazolam. So some concerns, well, they couldn't do the randomized blinded trial, so they did an unblinded trial, and it may be that physicians have preferences and might have ranked some of these drugs better based on their personal preferences. Uh, because it was un unrandomized, there were some baseline differences between groups that may have affected the outcomes. Uh, you wonder whether a binary outcome of adequate sedation at 15 minutes is optimal, and you know maybe you'd look at something like the area under the uh, sedation curve, like how quickly and how long is the sedation effective. Um, and then this like 90% rate of alcohol intoxication, you know, makes me wonder if it's generalizable. I, I think uh, that's an incredibly high rate. And then finally, it, it doesn't look at some of the other drugs that we might be interested in, like ketamine or um, phenothiazine, benzo combinations, which are probably in pretty wide use. So the bottom line, all of the drugs worked. You can't really tell which the best agent is. Probably midazolam and olanzapine are the fastest, and it makes me think, hmm, I might try olanzapine at some point. I just use old drugs, though. Um, you know, it came to me reading this article, hey, wouldn't it make sense if we were using benzos for deliriums and drug intoxications and antipsychotics for psychotics? Um, but mm, I don't know if that's true or not. I have to get one of the toxicologists to talk about that. Okay. Another case, um, so, oh, this is the answer. Sorry, and the answer is that all of those are correct. Okay, uh, so another case, uh, this is about sepsis. Uh, this is a 77-year-old woman who comes coughing, sputum, hypoxic, febrile, blood pressure of 100 over 60, tempo 38.4. So you refer them to internal medicine for admission after an appropriate workup and initiating antibiotics. The resident says, what is the lactate? So what is your best response? Hmm, I forgot to order that. B, it doesn't matter. Hmm, 4.8, make it up on the spot. <laughs> D, I try to treat the patient, not the test. So this is a really fascinating study. This is a multi-center study from 28 ICUs in South America. Uh, 70 to somewhere between 70, 75% of the patients came out of emergency departments, so they're very relevant septic patients for us. They noted that the surviving sepsis campaign is recommended that we follow, uh, that we track serial lactates every two to four hours uh, as a marker of uh, treatment effectiveness and you know, to guide therapy. So these guys thought of something ingenious. They said, well, let's compare lactate to pushing on their thumb and checking their capillary refill instead. <clears throat> and the advantage to that, it responds pretty quickly to resuscitation. So instead of looking at uh, every two hours like they did with lactate, they looked at a capillary refill every 30 minutes. And it was, it was you know, standardized. People went through training. They actually required glass microscope slides to put over their thumb pad for 10 seconds uh, of pallor before they measured the uh, capillary refill. So they tried to make it you know, a, a good uh, test. They uh, enrolled 400, over 400 patients with septic shock. Uh, all of the patients got an initial fluid challenge to assess fluid response and had their MAP titrated to more than 65 using an initial fluid, uh, initial fluid challenges and or norepi drips. After they had a MAP over 65, they were randomized to every 30 minute administration of crystalloids, 500 cc's every 30 minutes, depending on and titrated to either capillary refill or lactate. Outcome, 28-day mortality and organ dysfunction scores. Uh, results, the capillary refill group had lower mortality, um, 35 versus 43%. 
That's a pretty big difference, but based on sample size, doesn't quite get the p-value of 0.05. They also had better organ dysfunction scores at 72 hours, and that was statistically significant. So the capillary fill group did better than the lactate group. The author's conclusion, because of the non-inferiority um, uh, design of the trial, was that in patients with septic shock, a strategy targeting capillary refill time did not reduce 28-day mortality compared with serum lactate. But it looked better on the parameters they studied. So some uh, criticisms. Again, this is an unblinded study. People clearly knew which patients were in the capillary refill group. But with unblinded study, uh, studies, you worry about outcome ascertainment, and death is sort of a hard outcome. Um, you know, you, you probably can't, uh, if you have a bias as a provider, say, yeah, this patient's dead. No, they're not. <laughs> um, probably the reason this happens is that lactate clearance lags behind physiologic parameters and may lead to incorrect treatments. And think of, you know, the white blood cell count. We think maybe white blood cells have some correlation with sepsis or acute illnesses or treatment of acute illnesses, but you wouldn't dream of doing like white, cell, white blood cell count reductions as a marker of um, treatment effectiveness. And maybe, maybe uh, lactate doesn't uh, make any more sense than that. Uh, the other thing I wonder is, um, did the clinicians and, and the doctors who were in the um, capillary refill group pay closer attention to their patients and look at their patients because they couldn't look at lactates. So were they treating the patient or the test? And then the other thing that is particularly relevant, well, it's relevant to a lot of diagnostic tests we do, but um, it's particularly relevant to lactate. And um, a test result or a test doesn't become useful if it has some sort of helpful sensitivity and specificity parameters. A test is helpful if it tells us something we didn't already know. And so, you know, the question is in septic shock patients or septic patients or whatever patients you're using this test in, how often did you not know the patient was sick before you did the lactate? Um, so um, anyway, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why this finding um, may have occurred but I think this is a fascinating study. So the correct answer to the resident, I try to treat the patient, not the test, even if you actually just forgot to order it. Okay, this is a really cool study. Um, so you, you've heard about, you've seen therapy animals at the airport and therapy animals uh, in the uh, uh, hospitals. So this is an emergency-based trial of therapy animals for reducing admission rates in the elderly. So the background is there's some small studies that show uh, benefits for older people treated in the presence of animals. Animals relieve social isolation and boredom. These have not been studied in the ED setting. So double-blind randomized trial, consecutive consenting ED patients over 80 who were referred for hospitalist admission excluded with hypoxia, shock, sepsis, or sensitivity to animal dander. So patients and caregivers are blinded to the intervention. Uh, patients are randomized to low, medium, or high intensity treatment. <laughs> okay, so maybe this actually isn't a real study, but it's a great idea. <clears throat> Okay, um, so this is a case of a 62-year-old male, uh, very young for his age, building a paving stone walkway, develops back pain that progresses to severe radicular pain. Every drug, including hydromorphone, is ineffective. They come into the emergency department. You suggest A, a ketamine infusion, B, gabapentin, C, a course of dexamethasone, D, zopiclone. Okay, we'll talk about that later. So this is focused on anticonvulsants for uh, back pain and uh, sciatica. And uh, so interestingly, uh, when I looked at this, there's actually references to support the statement that back pain causes more disability than any other condition. Uh, so it's a systematic review of the use of gabapentinoids for uh, back pain and sciatica. 
uh, with outcomes of self-reported pain and disability. So just published in CMAJ 2018. There's some really interesting history behind this drug. So this drug uh, showed up in the early 90s. Uh, they made huge profits with gabapentin from 1995 to 2003. Uh, there was then a successful class action lawsuit against Pfizer, plus felony charges for fraudulent marketing <clears throat> and misrepresentation of research data. They got a half a billion dollar fine. And that seemed to have a pretty good effect because since then gabapentin use has increased eightfold and now it's indicated for way more things than what it was uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So this was a systematic review of trials of patients who had back pain, radicular pain. Um, and what it basically showed, the, the short story is that of the 15 randomized trials, uh, 14 of the 15 showed no benefit for any of the indications. <clears throat> uh, while it showed no evidence for benefit, um, it did show some significant uh, evidence for adverse events. So does this mean, I mean, um, you know, you think, okay, I could maybe write a prescription for gabapentin uh, because 10,000 pain specialists can't be wrong. Um, and, you know, maybe if the alternative is giving opioids, maybe that's a, a reasonable option. Uh, but should we, in fact, not be using this drug? Well, I would say that, you know, the proud history of medicine has told us over and over again that just because something doesn't work, we don't have to stop using it. <laughs> um, Okay, so this uh, incredibly fit young 62-year-old male is me, and in, in June, I woke up one day with back pain, and the next day with sciatica. I had Advil, Tylenol, Methocarbamol, Hydromorphone. I actually asked for a prescription of gabapentin because none of those other drugs had any effect. So in football, that's called a Hail Mary. Um, so gabapentin didn't work either. Uh, I also got a ketamine infusion, uh, two drugs that worked, and of course, this is the N of one trial. This is quite weak evidence. The drug that clearly worked was Zopiclone because I could lie down and sleep for you know, five hours. And the other drug that I think may have worked, uh, uh, even, even better than my um, spinal block, uh, was a course of dexamethasone, and there is a, quite old evidence that uh, in patients with sciatica, which is an inflammatory ischemic compression of a nerve root, uh, that uh, steroids uh, probably have some beneficial effects. Okay, another study. So I saw this uh, study very recently in the Annals of Emergency Medicine and it totally blew me away. But before I discuss it, I'm gonna give you like a little pretest to see you know, whether you guys know any of this stuff already. So, so based on this systematic review of 65 studies, which of the following factors are associated with subsequent opioid misuse in patients who get an ED opioid prescription? Okay, does anyone think previous substance use? Yeah, lots of, lots of hands up. Previous mental health diagnosis? Lots of hands up. Age under 40 versus older people. Lots of hands up. Male sex. More hands up. All of the above. Just about everyone. So I really thought this was like a, an amazing study, but I guess even if there's nothing new in it, it's still like a landmark study, isn't it? So anyway, uh, that, was, that was a systematic review that kind of told us think everything we already knew about uh, prescribing opioids for patients in emergency departments. I don't think it warrants a lot more study. Okay, now um, it's really hard, you know, to stand up in front of an audience and talk about research and literature for an hour and keep people awake. And, you know, believe it or not, I was actually thinking I would get my dog and start a central line up here on the, on the front uh, you know, area here, but I don't have a dog. Um, and I was at a conference not that long ago, 
and I saw the most amazing uh, like thing, this trick that this speaker used to kind of rouse the audience. Uh, so this guy pulls a $20 bill out of his pocket, you know, kind of walks, walks down into the audience and says, like, you know, who wants the $20 bill? And everybody was up and at it. So I decided not to do that. Um, so instead, I'm just going to try and, like, give you some good studies here. <clears throat> okay. This is a, uh, a study of pediatric finger fracture management. And when you're talking about uh, pediatric research, it's really important to remember that pediatric studies are not just small adult studies. And so you have to treat them differently. Uh, so for example, I like to speak for like 0.5 minutes per kilogram about a pediatric study uh, when I talk about them. And um, so this, this was a study of pediatric finger fractures, and the, uh, the authors suggested that lots of times these are mismanaged, that people have a lot of discomfort knowing what to do with pediatric hand fractures. And so they, they had a belief, I think, that you know probably just putting buddy tape on these fingers is as good as big fancy splints. Uh, so their objective was to study buddy tape versus splinting for extra articular fractures, so not uh, fractures involving the joint surface. So this is a randomized clinical trial. And they, I think they had a pretty good model for identifying what fractures are low-risk fractures. So they said that <clears throat> if fractures were rotated, they needed to be reduced. If they were angulated more than 10 degrees in uh, a frontal plane or more than 25 degrees uh, in the um, dorsal palmar, no, that wouldn't be the dorsal palmar plane, would it? Anyway, if they were more than 25 degrees that way. So that makes sense because rotation is bad. Uh, fingers and joints can adapt and remodel to a fairly large amount of uh, angulation that's in the same direction as joint movement. Um, so I think it's a, it's a reasonable um, model for identifying high-risk fractures. <clears throat> they considered oblique, spiral, and comminuted fractures unstable and excluded those. So if you see an oblique, spiral, or comminuted fracture, um, then um, this evidence doesn't necessarily apply to that. And they randomized patients to getting either a splint or buddy tape. And in the hand fracture industry, you know, we call buddy tape BT. And this was not just a little metal splint they put on the finger. This was a splint that extended to the forearm, uh, cocked the wrist back um, in uh, intrinsic plus position, and went right out to the fingertips to make sure that those fingers were well immobilized. OK, about 100 kids, two-thirds with displaced fractures. Um, so 31 of them needed reduction prior to being randomized to an immobilization method. And their primary outcome, secondary displacement, did the fracture move out of position after initial um, immobilization? So displacement occurred in 2% of buddy tapes and 6.4% of splinted patients, despite those very aggressive splints. Every patient who displaced uh, was a reduced fracture. So none of these were uh, in stable initial fractures that didn't require reduction. And uh, basically, all the outcomes were better with the buddy tape. So. Um, Oh, and, and I, missed, I missed one thing there. So, so all of the displacements were in post-reduced fractures. They were also all in little fingers, if you read the, the text of the article. And I first thought, of course they're in little fingers. These are little people, for God's sakes. <laughs> and then I realized they meant they're in little fingers. So these are all in the fifth finger, which I thought was interesting. That's not something I knew before. So some interesting concern about this study. Um, so this is also a single blind study. Clearly, people knew what type of immobilization they had. 
Uh, they didn't blind the patients. They didn't blind the treating physicians. But they needed to call it a single blind study, so they blinded the data analyst. The person who was calculating p-values did not know whether the patient had a splint uh, or a buddy tape on. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so the, most of the patients showed up for their 21-day outcome. Uh, about half of them showed up for their 42-day outcomes, which is probably OK, because if something's going to displace, it's going to displace in the first three weeks. If displacement <coughs> does occur at three weeks, you think, hmm, mm, is that always important? Probably not. Anyway, uh, I thought this was um, had some good conclusions. So little fingers are not just small index fingers. Uh, buddy taping is probably as good as splinting uh, in this uh, low risk group of uh, pediatric finger fractures, which uh, comprises most pediatric finger fractures. Okay, another very interesting study. So this is the effect of a heart care pathway on chest pain care in the emergency departments. So these authors suggest that, you know, we're still not very good with chest pain. We miss people who have 30-day uh, MACE events, so uh, MI revascularization events mostly, uh, and that if we um, use chest pain decision tools at the point of care, and there's lots of chest pain decision rules out there, uh, that we will probably improve our uh, miss rates and our safety, and we will also uh, do less over-investigation of these patients. So what they did, they, this is Kaiser California, uh, big, uh, big institutions. Uh, they implemented a heart care pathway. Some of you will be familiar with the heart, uh, the heart rule or the heart decision tool. And so they actually built this into point of care electronic decision support. So physicians were supposed to calculate a heart score when they saw the patient, add in the tropo troponin result, and the software would tell them either discharge this patient, investigate them uh, with uh, stress testing, uh, or refer them for hospitalization. So this was uh, patients in the ED who had suspected acute coronary syndrome. They looked at admission and observation out to 30 days, and then diagnostic utilization in the form of stress testing, uh, as well as 30-day uh, death MI uh, and MACE events. So there's a lot of uh, chest pain decision tools out there. I'm not really sure um, why the heart score is the flavor of the day, <clears throat> other than the fact that if you look at this, it's clearly so simple and intuitive that you can remember it without you know, needing. Uh, I mean, look at the stuff in there. This is not a simple tool. And there's a lot of things in there that are um, quite subjective. So is this pain moderately suspicious? Is it highly suspicious? Does the patient have any of these risk factors? You'll even notice that having an elevated troponin doesn't um, eliminate the possibility of you being discharged. So it's an interesting score, and I'm not sure why it's there, uh, but it led to quite an interesting study. So they looked at 31,000 chest pain visits prior to pathway implementation. Again, I said this is Kaiser California, big multi hospital um, uh, organization. And then a similar number, 35,000 patients after the implement of this pathway. And they found that their primary outcome, admission and stress testing, plummeted from 35% to 32%. And that there was really no difference in their 30-day safety outcomes. So the study conclusion, heart safely reduced admission and stress testing using heart to risk stratify patients improved efficiency and quality of care. So this is good. This is a really good thing, apparently. A um, couple of problems. A lot of patients never had a heart score calculated. Um, and most of the time, if they did have a heart score calculated, the physicians didn't follow the heart recommendations. The question is why. And what I, I have to apologize because this is the this is the statistical mumbo-jumbo part, and so I'm actually going to use some two-by-two two tables to show you the things you should be thinking about if you look at a study of a diagnostic test. 
So the thing we probably care the most about with most of our diagnostic tests is sensitivity. How sensitive are they? So what you see in the left column is patients who had disease. Uh, and then going across, you see heart positive. That means patients who had a positive heart um, tool and patients who had a negative heart tool. And so uh, what this whole four by four, uh, sorry, two by two table tells you is that they looked at <clears throat> 12,267 patients who had heart evaluations made. Of those, 12,216 did not have a 30-day outcome event, 51 did. Uh, then if you go back and talk about sensitivity, look at that left column, uh, the definition of sensitivity is if the patient lying in front of me has the disease, how likely is the test going to tell me that? So it's the true positives, that 39 over the uh, total people with disease, which is 51. So that's a 76% sensitivity. And in the area of ACS diagnosis, we kind of accept a, sense, a sensitivity of 98%. This is way down. This is not good sensitivity. Note that this is quite a low prevalence population. Specificity. That's the true negative rate. So now you move to the next column, which is all people who do not have the disease in question. So the question is, how often is the test right in patients who don't have the diagnosis? So that's the true negatives, 7192 over 12,216. So pretty marginal sensitivity, 59% sensitivity, not wonderful at all. Now when we go from sensitivity specificity to predictive values, we shift to moving horizontally. That top row is all of the patients who had a positive heart tool result. And so positive predictive value is of all the people who had a positive test, how many actually had the disease? So that's the true positive, that's at 39 over 5,063. So positive predictive value with this uh, heart pathway was 0.8%. And what that means is if the physicians in this study had followed the guide of this heart pathway, uh, they would have admitted 5,063 patients and investigated them. And of those patients, 0.8% actually had something wrong with them. If they had actually taken a different approach and discharged every single patient of the 12,000 plus, um, they would have missed 51 cases uh, which is a sensitivity of about 99.6%. <clears throat> so, and they wouldn't have admitted anyone to hospital. What, they, what the author said is that, well, this is pretty amazing because it has great negative predictive value. So negative predictive value is in that second line of all the people who had a negative test, how many were truly disease free? And so what you see there is that 7,192 had, that's like 99.8% negative predictive value. So what they said is this is really safe because if heart is negative, the patient does not have a problem. So some concerns here. This is a study of a diagnostic test. There's not a two by two table to be seen in the article. They don't talk about sensitivity, specificity. Um, but they demonstrate poor sensitivity, which means this is not safe. Uh, I indicated that uh, the um, physicians, if they'd followed this pathway, would have been way less efficient and much less safe than if they just followed clinical judgment. So the question is, how does a study like this even get published? And I feel like it's because most physicians and apparently uh, journal editors at high quality journals don't really mm, pay much attention to diagnostic testing uh, theory. There's the big teaching point I want to give you, uh, because you'll see this in many, 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 many studies. You'll read the abstract and it'll say, negative predictive value is outstanding. If the test is negative, uh, these patients have nothing wrong with them. And so I'm going to tell you, uh, predictive value is not actually a diagnostic test parameter. It, it just reflects mostly uh, the prevalence of disease in the population being tested. And this is something that my grandmother taught me when I was five years old. Uh, seriously. Um, now, 
This is actually an example I've used before, but it's so long ago that the people who've seen me uh, present this example are already senile and probably don't even remember what they did at the break, so I don't mind going through this again. <clears throat> so when I was um, five years old, I moved to live with my grandparents in Kelwood, Manitoba, and my grandmother was very conscientious. The first thing she taught me was how to safely cross the road. So she gave me a nickel, <clears throat> took me to the side of the road and said, flip the coin. If it comes up head, it's safe to cross. Don't even look for cars because the coin is better. So I did that for six months and it was amazing. I, every time I flipped the coin and it was heads, I walked across, there was never a car coming. Why is that? There are no cars in Kelwood, Manitoba. There is never a car coming no matter what the coin tells you. So if you have a low prevalence population, like in this study where 51 of 12,000 patients actually had something wrong with them, if you flip the coin and get a negative test result, it is always going to be right. <laughs> if, you, uh, if I took my coin back home to Calgary or Vancouver and tried to cross a street, the first time I tried to cross, the test would be wrong because this is a high prevalence population and in high prevalence populations, negative predictive value is useless and positive predictive value is excellent. So really interesting study that I think got published because people don't seem to understand uh, diagnostic testing very well. Okay, another case. This is one from about like 10 days ago. So I'm working with a medical student the medical student comes and tells me about a patient they just saw, a 38-year-old who has acute porphyria. So how do you respond to that? You say, well, that's not even a real diagnosis. Come on. Um, this guy's been vomiting continuously for four days. He's had the com community paramedics at his house every day giving him two liters of fluid, gravel, on Danzatron, but he's failing outpatient treatment and he feels he needs hospitalization, and this is something that happens four or five times a year. So, other information that you think you might find interesting? Does this guy use marijuana? Yes, he uses it daily, but he assures me his diagnosis is acute porphyria. <clears throat> so, you, I, order Haldol. 10 minutes later, the charge nurse and the bedside nurse point out to me that Haldol can cause prolonged QT intervals and wonder if this patient needs to be put on a monitor. So I could only give them like an old guy answer. I said, I finished my residency in 1984. They didn't even invent prolonged QT intervals till 1998. <laughs> By that time, I had treated 10,000 patients with IV Haldol and never had a problem. I don't think there's going to be a problem. So this is a really interesting study that Frank Schurmeyer, who's a genius, uh, just published in Academic Emergency Medicine. And so we worry a lot in eMERGE about QT intervals. They're very common. Uh, they're usually incidental findings. We don't really know how significant they are. So this was an ECG database study. So um, basically how it was done was to take um, every ED patient uh, at two hospitals in Vancouver over, I think, a period of a year, and, and then look at those ECGs in the MUSE database and randomly select an intervention group that had prolonged QT intervals, more than 460, and compare them to a random group of patients who had a normal QT interval, uh, then match these patients on sex, age, and whether they got admitted or discharged. So age 65, half male, 58% uh, uh, were discharged. All of the comorbidities, and there was pretty extensive review of comorbidities and other uh, predictors, they all looked the same in the two groups. Uh, the things that were different, the QT group had a little more hypomagnesemia, but not a lot, only 1.3%. Uh, they had a little more ACS and a little more congestive failure. Um, the key findings, 30-day mortality, no difference, a little higher um, <clears throat> in the normal QT group. No other uh, differences in ventricular arrhythmias, seizures, syncopes, or cardiac arrests. So bad things 
did not happen to these ED patients with prolonged QT intervals. Uh, he did another analysis looking at the more severe group that was over uh, 500 milliseconds uh, and found essentially the same uh, thing. So how do you explain this? Uh, most of the data we have come from hospitalized patients who were probably hospitalized because there was something wrong with them. Um, in the emergency department, an asymptomatic QT prolongation probably doesn't have the same significance uh, as it would if you've got somebody who's known to have structural heart disease or a congenital prolonged QT interval or is seriously ill. So think about the patients, not just the tests. Okay, my red light just went on, so I, I have to wind up here. Uh, I'll just tell you the bottom line on this study of intranasal ketamine versus fentanyl in kids with extremity injuries. So this is, of course, kids from 8 to 17 years of age. Um, <clears throat> and uh, patients with moderate to severe pain, they were given intranasal ketamine 1.5 per kilo or intranasal fentanyl 2 per kilo. The bottom line is they had similar uh, pain reductions uh, and a very high level of safety, so ketamine is probably um, as good as intranasal fentanyl uh, in this situation, although there were more nuisance side effects. There was you know, a, a few kids who had you know, agitation and dizziness. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about uh, dual antiplatelets for minor strokes, but you should use them for minor strokes or severe TIAs, and my summary slide I'll let you guys look at, and I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat>